Uh, good afternoon to everyone who is uh, uh, listening and uh, viewing the slides. Um, we will be talking today about direct hydrocarbon indicators. I'll define what those are and uh, show a few examples. Um, as is my custom, uh, this is the terms for use. Uh, I did get a um, email um, forwarded to me from uh, one student who asked permission to use that with other students. That is not necessary. As uh, long as uh, it is uh, students uh, who are wanting to use it or faculty or staff that uh, teach um, uh, students who are, are still uh, full-time students, uh, that is fine. Uh, the main restriction is that it is not to be used for people who are already employed or by instructors who are teaching people who are employed. So here's the uh, basic outline. I won't read all of the uh, items. We'll go through these uh, systematically. The first uh, thing uh, is a question, what is a DHI? And the DHI is an acronym which stands for Direct Hydrocarbon Indicator. And so seismic DHIs are some type of an anomalous seismic response or seismic signal uh, that is uh, associated with the presence of hydrocarbons. DHIs occur when changes in the pore fluids cause the uh, elastic properties of the rock to change. And uh, there is a big enough change in the elastic properties, the uh, uh, velocity and density primarily, that uh, we can detect that seismically. Another way to put that is that there is a fluid effect. Uh, one of the main DHIs that uh, we love to see are amplitude anomalies where the presence of hydrocarbons produces a stronger than expected uh, 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 seismic amplitude, either a, a positive peak or a negative trough, and I'll show an example of that. Uh, DHIs display one or more types of characteristics that are consistent with hydrocarbons filling up the pore space within the rock. And I think there are seven different types of DHI uh, characters uh, that we'll be talking about as the, the uh, seminar proceeds. So to uh, start, rock property uh, trends uh, change with depth. And so what I he have here on the x-axis is velocity, or it could also be impedance uh, as a function of depth on the y-axis. Uh, shale is the uh, black line. Uh, a sand that has brine in the pore space is the blue line. And you can see shallow, the shales are higher velocity or higher impedance than the water sands. But as we get at deeper depths, uh, there's actually a crossover. Uh, the sands have higher velocity and higher impedance. The green line is oil sands. And you can see that uh, in all cases, the velocity and the impedance are lower uh, when we have oil in a uh, reservoir rock as opposed to having brine in the same rock. And the red is if uh, gas is the poor uh, fluid and uh, gas is even more anomalously low in velocity and impedance. Uh, gas is also uh, very much lower in density. So we can consider reflection coefficients. Uh, here we have a plot, a function of depth. Reflection coefficients, zero would be right here. And what we're um, displaying is what would the reflection coefficient be if we had a shale uh, sitting on top of a sand with either brine or oil or gas in it. So because of that crossover at a certain depth, there would actually be no reflection coefficient. The shales and the water sands would have the same impedance. At shallower depths, the shales are uh, higher impedance, so we would have a negative reflection coefficient at the base of the shale, top of the sand. But as we get deeper, we would have a positive reflection coefficient. Uh, for the oil, uh, the reflection coefficient is going to be more negative, and for a gas head, it's going to be even more negative. And so if we're working in this part of the depth range, uh, 
we should have a noticeable de uh, 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 amplitude anomaly associated with an oil sand and an extremely large anomaly associated with a gas sand. And both the oil sand and the gas sand would have negative reflection coefficients. And so depending on how the polarity is, that would be a very uh, strong peak or a very strong trough. If we are looking at a deeper depth, uh, we still see that the oil and gas sands have uh, much lower reflection coefficients, but the differences are getting smaller and smaller. And at some point, we're going to get to the point where the amplitude differences are not as significant. They may not be detected uh, given the data quality and the uh, uh, decrease in uh, uh, resolution as we get deeper. And so people talk about a DHI floor, that would be the depth from there lower when we would not expect to have a discernible seismic signature associated with uh, hydrocarbon in sands. Uh, this plot's quite similar here is impedance units and depth in thousands of feet. Uh, this is for Gulf of Mexico clastics. And again, if you're working shallow, uh, there's a big difference between shale and uh, water-bearing sands versus oil sands, and an even more significant uh, change as uh, we have a uh, gas sand. As we get deeper, those differences remain, but the magnitudes of the differences get less and less. And so at some point, we may get to the uh, oil DHI floor, uh, here, we'd have to go greater than uh, 10,000 feet to get to the gas DHI floor. Uh, this is a uh, plot, a cross plot of uh, bulk modulus versus density. And uh, for uh, a reservoir quality sand with brine versus oil versus gas, uh, these plot in different uh, spaces on this uh, two-dimensional cross section. So if we have information where we know something about the density and the bulk modulus, uh, we can uh, predict what type of fluid should be in our um, potential reservoir units. So um, the seismic waves that go through the rocks are sensitive both to the rock uh, and the rock matrix, uh, but it's also, they're also sensitive to the fluid properties as well. Uh, the grain properties are controlled primarily by mineralogy. And so do we have uh, quartz sands or do we have uh, 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 clay material? Do we have uh, rocks with a different type of mineralogy? Uh, maybe carbonate uh, mineralogy, maybe dolomite, uh, maybe uh, salt. The rock framework properties are controlled by things such as the mineralogy, the sorting of the uh, grain uh, particles, the texture, the degree of compaction, the deep degree of cementation, and the compaction, cementation, sorting, texture all impact porosity. And so we may have a good reservoir with lots of uh, porosity and permeability, and maybe that's filled with brine. Uh, if the fluid changes from brine and we have either oil or gas, the seismic properties, the acoustic properties of the rocks uh, are going to be sensitive to what the pressure and temperature of the rocks are, what the gas gravity is, what the GOR, that's uh, an acronym for uh, gas oil ratio, API is the gravity of the hydrocarbon, the salinity of the water, and the uh, hydrocarbon saturation or uh, uh, alternatively the water saturation. So as we change uh, fluids, the acoustic properties are going to change. So if my reference is uh, the properties, the velocity and density associated with a brine filled sand, then if we fill the pores with oil instead, it's going to have a lower velocity and a lower density, and that's going to impact the reflection coefficients at the top and the base, and therefore the amplitudes at the top and the base. Or if we fill it with gas, uh, then it's going to have even more uh, depressed velocities and much lower densities than the 
uh, water or brine filled sand case. We can also uh, talk about things such as fluid contacts. So here uh, in my color uh, coordinated uh, system, uh, red means uh, gas, the blue would be water or brine. And so in the uh, top of this uh, faulted anticline, we have gas in the pore space, so red. Down here, we have water in the pore space, so blue. And so we can have a boundary, which uh, is almost uh, universally going to be flat uh, in a depth section, maybe not in two-way time. But we can get a change in the acoustic properties for the sand as we go from gas-filled to water-filled. And if I get a seismic response uh, associated with that change in the fluids, then that can give me a DHI, a direct hydrocarbon indicator. And I'll uh, show some examples of that in a few minutes here. Uh, the way the fluids are, uh, the hydrocarbon will always have lower impedance than the water or brine filled sand. So we can have a surface through here associated with that uh, change in fluid, a um, uh, gas water contact in this case, and it will always be lower to higher impedance, so a positive reflection coefficient. So we can see a change in reflection amplitude, uh, reflection coefficient and reflection amplitude across the top of the uh, reservoir unit. And we may see evidence for a fluid contact, a gas water contact, such as illustrated here. We could have an oil water contact if the upper fluid was oil and not gas. And if we have gas with an oil leg and then brine, we could have a gas oil contact as well. Oops, I think I slipped. slipped. Um, so let's talk a little bit about DHI analysis. Uh, this is kind of a workflow chart. It's a little busy, uh, but uh, let me go through it. Uh, we have rock property analysis. Uh, if we have well logs, we can get information about the rock and the fluid properties. Is our area that we're interested above the DHI floor? If not, then we're not going to do any DHI analysis. If it's above the DHI floor, we can do some things in processing, and we can also do some things in modeling. Hopefully, our processing is going to be um, controlled amplitude and controlled phase so that we have a good representation preserved uh, between the reflection coefficients and the acoustic uh, nature of the rocks and the seismic uh, response, especially amplitudes. We can look at uh, pre-stacked migrated gathers. We can generate a zero phase stack. We can look at amplitude versus offset stacks, uh, and we'll talk more about AVO uh, on our next lecture on Thursday. In modeling, we can consider the range of possible models we have, uh, how uh, porous and permeable might the sand be, uh, how, what might be the fluid uh, fill, might it be uh, water or gas or oil, so we can model different uh, scenarios. Uh, we can use theory to help us out with that. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments here. We can model what the uh, zero phase seismic response would be and compare that to the actual data uh, as part of our DHI analysis. We can also model what the AVO response would be and compare that to observed AVO response in the real seismic data. And all of that can then help me in my interpretation and uh, my rating as to whether I have a valid uh, DHI or not. So uh, do I get the response that I expect at the well? And if the well data isn't available, then I might be able to use analog information or theoretical information to try to uh, compensate for the lack of well data. Uh, let's talk now about the DHI characteristics. And uh, here's my list, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The four main uh, DHIs that uh, people love to look for and find, uh, the first is amplitude strength, and uh, second is impedance signature, third is amplitude versus offset response, 
Fourth is evidence for a fluid contact. And then not as uh, impressive, but also valuable can be the presence of chimneys, of sag, and attenuation of, uh, of uh, the higher frequencies. So I'll go through these uh, one by one. So amplitude strength, in the presence of hydrocarbons, we can get a very anomalous amplitude response. So on uh, the piece of seismic in the black and white, uh, we see this trough is extremely large, swings to the left, high amplitude, comes down to be moderate. And then at the base of the reservoir, a very strong peak that comes uh, turns into a moderate peak. And so we can uh, generate a synthetic for that. Uh, I have a pretty good match to a, a fairly uh, strong uh, trough followed by a very large peak. And uh, based on just looking at this seismic, I would say probably hydrocarbon extends down to about this level where that anomalously a big amplitude uh, disappears. We can also look for impedance signature. Uh, here we have regular reflection amplitude data. We have some pretty high amplitudes here and here. Uh, we can do something called uh, uh, inversion and try to get what the impedance is, not just the uh, uh, reflection amplitude. Uh, there is a unit uh, coming up um, uh, towards the end of this series uh, where I'll talk about uh, uh, inversion of seismic to get impedance. The thing to note here is low impedance is the hot colors. And here we have an anomaly. We go from green into orange back into green. So uh, there's a low impedance lens here, and it corresponds to this strong amplitude response. There's a predicted or modeled low impedance lens down here associated with this strong amplitude response. And so we can use things such as uh, uh, looking for uh, low impedance as a way in which to uh, try to verify that we have hydrocarbons present in the sections. Amplitude versus offset, AVO. Uh, that's what we will talk about uh, on Thursday in the next les lesson. Uh, very briefly, here I have a reservoir. If I look at the zero uh, offset response, so the source and receiver are um, co-located, uh, I get a, a moderate uh, trough followed by a moderate peak. If I can split that out into a near angle stack and a far angle stack, uh, you can see you go from moderate to a really strong trough at the top, and then at the base, a moderate peak to a very strong peak. And so looking for how amplitude varies as a function of offset or uh, actually uh, uh, reflection angle is uh, what is more theoretically appropriate, um, that can tell us something about the type of fluid in a particular reservoir. We can look for evidence of uh, fluid contacts. Uh, one uh, of those is looking for, for a flat spot. Uh, this is an uh, example that I pulled off the uh, internet. Uh, the blue is the top of the reservoir. You can see that it's really strong red and it gets into a, uh, a lighter shade of red. And you can see cutting across uh, this black uh, it's uh, cutting across the stratigraphy, which is inclined uh, down to the right, similar to the uh, interpreted blue horizon. And this is due to the change of, uh, hydrocarb of fluid type from hydrocarbon above this black to water or brine below it. And so this is a uh, classic type of response that we will see if the uh, acoustic properties are uh, just right, and if the reservoir is thick enough that we can see the expression of that uh, fluid uh, contact, which is uh, sometimes referred to as a flat spot. We can also see a polarity reversal. And so here is the top of the reservoir. It's in a black or a peak, and then it flips into the red or a trough. And so we go from uh, one type of polarity here, 
uh, I would uh, have to say that an inc uh, decrease in impedance would be a peak over a trough. And over here, uh, we have an increase in impedance uh, trough over a peak. And so this uh, flipping of polarity uh, is uh, associated with or attributed to the fact that we have hydrocarbons uh, causing the sands to have lower impedance here. The sands have a higher impedance here high enough that they're higher than the overlying shales, and uh, we get a change of the sign of the uh, reflection coefficient positive to negative, or ne negative to positive. Uh, we can see abrupt down dip terminations. Uh, here we have the top of a reservoir. You notice right here this little abrupt termination of this really strong amplitude event. Uh, there's a fluid contact right through here. And so where that amplitude dies off uh, very rapidly uh, is a clue that we have a change in the fluid content. And then fit to structure, if we have some sort of anomaly, in this case an amplitude anomaly, and we have contours, either two-way time or depth, we should see a good conformance that that amplitude anomaly fits within a particular depth contour. If the overlying velocity variations are um, insignificant, then a time contour will also uh, conform to the amplitude anomaly. Uh, if we do have variations in uh, lateral velocity above this uh, uh, anomalous feature, the um, fit to a time uh, contour may not, uh, not, may not be perfect, but it should be fairly consistent. So uh, let me take the shading off. So here's the amplitude along the horizon, and now I dim off uh, where the hydrocarbon where the hydrocarbon limits are, and so we see the edge of the hydrocarbon is conforming quite nicely to a particular depth contour. Some of the other indicators, uh, not as uh, common or not as strong or definitive that uh, hydrocarbons are present is uh, what are called uh, chimneys or seismic chimneys. Those are areas of uh, disrupted reflections. Uh, usually uh, uh, they look uh, pretty chaotic. Usually the amplitudes tend to be a bit lower. And so this would be a seismic chimney. One of the reasons that could develop is because I have a reservoir with a imperfect seal and gas is able to get through that seal and it's percolated in and disrupted the uh, acoustic structure above the top of the reservoir. So uh, that would be an interpretation of the extent of the disrupted seismic, and uh, that might be also what you would say is the uh, location of the gas that is uh, leaking out of the, uh, of the seal of the main reservoir unit. We can also see sag or time delay. And so here's the top of the reservoir. Uh, there's hydrocarbon in here. I think in this case it's uh, gas. And a uh, deeper horizon uh, comes along and then it dips down. And then uh, it's here as well. Uh, we would believe, and this is a time section, we would believe that the, the cyan horizon should have uh, uh, been very similar to the yellow, there should be a crest here. But because the velocities of the, uh, uh, the hydrocarbon are lower, it takes longer time for the energy to get down to that uh, 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 cyan horizon and back up. And because it's slower, it's delayed, it uh, comes in deeper in time uh, than what the true depth structure would be. And so we call something like this a sag. And then we can, uh, and I'm sorry, here's the uh, uh, distribution of the hydrocarbon. And again, I think this is an example of a, a gas field. And we can also get attenuation of frequencies. And so as we uh, get through the gas beneath that, uh, we will attenuate in the gas zone more of the higher frequencies. And so we would have uh, less high frequency, so overall we would see a lower frequency 
response below hydrocarbon. And so the higher frequency, lower amplitudes over here uh, are in contrast to the lower frequencies, uh, moderate amplitudes uh, beneath the, uh, the gas field. One of the things we want to do is to be able to predict seismic responses given different type of fluid fills and uh, different types of uh, porosity and uh, maybe reservoir thicknesses. So uh, we have two key questions that we're interested in at the depth that we're interested in. Uh, should we expect a distinct seismic response if hydrocarbons are present within porous zones or uh, possible reservoir units? So should an amplitude anomaly be observed? Is there a big enough change uh, in the impedance uh, numbers so that uh, we would be able to see something uh, as anomalous in terms of amplitude? And should there be an amplitude versus offset, an ABO type of anomaly? And again, we'll talk about ABO on Thursday. So here's an example uh, of a well. Uh, it had uh, brine in the reservoir. Here's where the reservoir is, the velocities, uh, the density. The density drops because of the hydrocarbon. The velocity uh, doesn't look like it's uh, uh, impacted much from what's above and below. Uh, this is the top of the reservoir on a zero phase seismic response. We get uh, somewhat of a moderate uh, uh, trough. I can do something called fluid substitution, and this is where theory comes in. Uh, we have some equations called Gassman equations, and we can uh, go through a series of steps to take a reservoir that has a particular fluid type and model what would it have been had it been filled with a different fluid. So in this case, the well had water or brine in it, we can do a fluid substitution and say, what if there was oil in there? You can see that the velocity is, uh, is uh, significantly lower. The density is also lower. That gives me a, a, more, uh, a larger negative reflection coefficient. And now this is the response at the top of the reservoir. Uh, and so I get a um, more negative peak or a stronger, uh, a, a more negative trough or a stronger trough and then I can model it as if gas is in the reservoir. Uh, it has an even slower velocity, even lower density. That gives me an even bigger negative reflection coefficient. And that gives me a much uh, more negative trough at the top of the reservoir. Uh, the next slide, I show the three types of responses. Uh, this is for the water or brine. And so we get a moderate trough at the top of the reservoir. For oil, we get a uh, more negative, uh, a bigger negative number for the trough at the top of the reservoir. And for gas, we get an even uh, stronger uh, response. And so by doing this type of modeling, we could say, uh, would I expect a change in the uh, amplitude associated with changing fluids from water to oil to gas? I can also, if I think I have uh, a uh, hydrocarbon sitting on top of water. Let's say I have an oil leg sitting on top of water. I can use modeling to try to estimate how big of a reflection amplitude change might I see. Uh, the next thing we have to do after we've identified one or more uh, DHI signatures is uh, estimate what the validity of the uh, features that I'm seeing in the seismic uh, is in terms of indicating uh, the presence of hydrocarbon. So if uh, we have a prospect, it has one or it has two or it might have five of the DHI characteristics, we want to evaluate uh, how valid is it to assume that what uh, we are noting as anomalous is due to the presence of hydrocarbon as opposed to something else. So there's three factors that we need to consider. The first is the DHI quality. Uh, how good does the DHI appear? Uh, is it something that is uh, easy to detect? Is it uh, uh, moderately easy or moderately difficult? Uh, is it something that uh, you need a lot of uh, wishful thinking to, to uh, uh, try to present that to management? 
And then DHA confidence, how confident are you in the data? And so this is where seismic data quality would come in, uh, uh, confidence that you have the right uh, fluid properties if you don't have a nearby well, uh, and uh, uh, things of that nature. And then uh, DHI corroboration, how many of the different DHI characteristics or signatures do you have? If it's simply a amplitude anomaly and you don't have any of the other signatures, uh, your uh, confidence, the validity isn't quite as high as if you have an amplitude anomaly and there's also a fluid contact and you also see uh, a sag of uh, deeper horizons. So with the DHI quality, uh, you'd have to look at the quality of each of the signature. Uh, what's the uh, quality of the amplitude strength of the impedance signature all the way down to uh, uh, conformance to structure. With the confidence, uh, you'd want to evaluate the data that you have, uh, how much well calibration do you have, and how local versus uh, regional is that, uh, how good is the physical property data you have about rock properties and fluid properties, how confident are you in the impedance signature? Uh, polarity becomes very important because we're looking for low impedance uh, gas sands or oil sands. If I have my polarity wrong, I may see an anomalous uh, event. I think that's due to the presence of hydrocarbon, and it turns out that it's a hard streak or maybe a carbonate lens, and it's not a decrease in impedance, but it turns out to be an increase in impedance. Uh, what type of uh, seismic are you working with? Uh, 2D seismic data doesn't give me as much confidence as if I'm working on 3D. And uh, by vintage, I mean the age of the uh, data uh, and the data processing. So if I have uh, 2D data that was processed in the 1980s, I probably wouldn't have a whole lot of confidence. But if I had 3D data that was uh, processed within the last uh, three years uh, and maybe uh, uh, had some uh, fairly sophisticated uh, uh, seismic migration, seismic imaging done to that, uh, I might have a, a, a fairly high confidence in the seismic data quality. And also the seismic data quantity. Uh, do I see the anomaly on a single 2D line or do I see it on a, a series of 20 uh, inlines in a 3D survey? So uh, we use those three factors to try to risk the DHI validity. And so we would consider, is my confidence low or moderate or high? Is the DHI quality low or moderate or high? And so it is much lower risk if I have a lot of confidence in the DHI and I have good quality. And then we can use things such as a radar plot uh, here we have one, two, three, four, five of the different types of anomalies. Uh, and so we can uh, consider uh, how valid might it be uh, in terms of uh, corroboration of more than one. And so we have an amplitude response and we have a hydrocarbon contact. So we have two of the seven possible DHI signatures uh, and uh, uh, that uh, having two is greater than having one. There are some advanced methods. Uh, one of the things that we can do is use a VPVS ratio of the data to help us to verify if uh, something that we see that is anomalous is related to present, uh, presence of hydrocarbons. Uh, this is a typical reflection amplitude uh, display. Uh, the very negative numbers, which would be the lower impedance, the possible hydrocarbons, are in the hotter colors, the reds and oranges. Uh, we can do some specialized high-end processing and uh, come up with a volume of data that indicates so the VP to VS ratio. Uh, that's the P wave velocity and the S wave velocity. Uh, and if it is a low value, in this case the greens, uh, that would be a good indication that the anomaly is due to the presence of hydrocarbons. There's also some uh, relatively new technology, uh, electromagnetic mapping or surveying. Uh, it is very recent uh, using uh, EM data. Uh, 
these data tend to be even lower resolution than seismic data, but if we merge the seismic data and the electromagnetic data, and we see an uh, anomaly in the uh, electromagnetic uh, resistivity of the uh, of the uh, uh, of an area, and it corresponds to a seismic anomaly. That gives us uh, more confidence that we have a hydrocarbon present. There are a number of pitfalls. Um, we may see flat reflections. We may interpret that as a fluid contact, but it could be that it's uh, something in, in the stratigraphy, or it could be a seismic multiple. Uh, and uh, there's a number of horror stories where people have drilled anomalies thinking they had a uh, fluid contact, and it turned out to be a multiple off of something very much shallower in the section. We could have hydrocarbons present, but it could be low gas saturation. So the reservoir has uh, maybe 10% uh, gas or even less. Uh, it can give me a very strong amplitude anomaly. So an amplitude anomaly doesn't necessarily uh, indicate that we have an economic amount of hydrocarbon. There could be other reasons why we have low impedance rocks. Uh, coals are very low impedance. Uh, we could have an area where the sands have uh, higher than average porosity locally, and that could give us uh, a, a change in the seismic uh, amplitude. So uh, we have to go through uh, what ifs. Um, what if it's hydrocarbon? Uh, what if it's coal? What if it's a uh, high porosity zone? What if my polarity is off and I'm not looking at a, an anomaly due to low impedance, but I'm do, looking at an anomaly due to high impedance, uh, such as maybe a carbonate lens or a tight streak or even a volcanic sill? There could be poor fit to structure, and we just uh, rationalize it away. We say it is an indication that hydrocarbon is present, but maybe there are some lateral facies changes, and that's why the anomaly doesn't fit the uh, depth structure contours as well as we would like. And uh, sometimes it's rationalization and you're hoping for the best. Uh, other times there could be facies changes that uh, would cause a poor fit to structure. And as I mentioned, uh, if the polarity is uh, not what you think it is, instead of uh, looking for, look, uh, instead of having a, an anomaly and you think it's a low impedance zone, associated with hydrocarbon, it could be a high impedance zone instead. So in summary, uh, seismic DHIs are anomalous seismic responses that are uh, associated with the presence of hydrocarbons. The acoustic impedance of a porous rock decreases as we take the brine out and we put in oil or we put in gas, and that is a cause for a lot of the DHI uh, signatures that we see. And the four main signatures that people look for and have uh, higher confidence in is uh, an amplitude anomaly. Uh, another term people use are bright spots, uh, a fluid contact reflection or a flat spot, the fit of an anomaly to structure, and the abrupt uh, termination of high amplitude reflections. So that concludes my uh, prepared remarks. And uh, I'll put up our agenda. Uh, Thursday, we'll talk about amplitude versus offset. Uh, then we have two more sessions next uh, week. Uh, we uh, one, one session next week, uh, time to depth conversion. Then we're going to have a break for about uh, three weeks. And October 24, I'll talk about seismic inversions. So I will turn the uh, microphone, so to speak, over to Dr. Sumi and see if there are some questions. Okay, well, thank you so much for that lecture, Fred. Um, there aren't any questions so far, but I always like to try to give people a minute to write your questions in on the chat box. Um, again, as Fred mentioned, um, there will be, we'll talk about amplitude versus offset this upcoming Thursday. Um, so um, same time, same place. Um, and if you, um, I'll probably put a pet message about that out on the Iris Message Center. Um, the link to that and how to sign up for that is in the chat box. Um, so, yeah, I think that's everything. <laughs>
Um, well, we still don't have any questions so far, so maybe everything was, was uber clear. Um, and Claudia just writes, no questions here, thank you. <laughs> so that's good to ah. hear that people are responding. Thank you, Claudia, for writing in. Um, appreciate it. So um, yeah, with that, I think we'll conclude today's seminar. Thank you so much, Fred. Okay, and thank you to uh, everyone who is uh, either uh, listening to the live uh, presentation or seeing the archived video. Yeah. And thank you, Dr. for your coordination once again. Sure thing. And of course, as soon as I start that, somebody always writes in a question. <laughs> so um, briefly, uh, Nalay asks, how can we differentiate the water gas contact and stratigraphy? The, uh, uh, the gas water contact uh, in depth uh, should be perfectly flat uh, unless there are some hydrodynamic uh, forces uh, acting on the, on the fluids. Um, the stratigraphy uh, doesn't necessarily have to be flat. Oftentimes in, an, in a trap, it will not be. So um, if you see a discordance, as uh, let's see if I can get the image. Oh, I think it's up on the. If you if you see a discordance between a reflector that's cutting across the apparent stratigraphic uh, uh, inclinations, uh, that's the uh, one way that you could get that. It would be a fluid contact. Another thing that could cause that is if you have something fairly flat lying in the shallow section and it comes in as a multiple, it can cut across the stratigraphy as well. So usually people look for a discordance between what they think is the stratigraphic dip and something that is uh, near to horizontal, and that is something that they would uh, flag as a possible flat spot. Uh, and then they would want to uh, verify that by looking at it on other seismic lines and seeing if they can map it around and seeing how well it fits to uh, uh, depth structures, ideally time structures uh, in the case where you don't have uh, the ability to convert it to depth. Great, thank you, Fred, and so and thank you for answering that um, last question. And uh, yeah, and we got a thanks back for that um, reply. Um, so thank you all so much for attending, and have a great rest of your day. Bye, everyone. Bye.